All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video here in the series on linear algebra. In the last video, we talked all about properties of matrices, right? Where we said, okay, now we, we understand that a matrix is simply a way to represent a linear map from one vector space into another. Let's see how we can uh, perform manipulations or, or I guess operations on various matrices, right? Like how to add two matrices or how to multiply two matrices. And we spend a lot of time talking about that. But there was one thing that I kind of wish that I had mentioned in, in the previous video. And it was one of those things where it was like, as soon as I was done recording, I was like, man, I, I wish I included that. But at that point I'd already finished the video and I just, I didn't want to redo the whole thing, right? So I figured I will just quickly mention one more thing now, which we might've already been able to interpolate or just kind of sort of get the idea, even if it wasn't explicitly mentioned. But now let's just explicitly mention it because I think it's a, an important idea for us to understand. So in the last video, we talked about multiplying two matrices together. And maybe I'm going to call those matrices A and B. And let's just say, for example, maybe to keep this very intuitive, let's say they're both three by three matrices. So we're working in R3 or three dimensional space. The inner dimensions match, which just means we can multiply them. And the resulting output matrix, maybe I'll call it C, is going to have the dimensions of the, the outer two dimensions. And since those are also both three, this is going to be a resulting three by three matrix. This is all fine. This is stuff that we've understood, hopefully. But we should keep in mind that matrices are, are functions that map from one vector space to another. And primarily we're interested in functions to see how they act on elements of a vector space. Or in other words, how they act on a vector, right? What I'm trying to say is that typically when we talk about matrices, we can be interested in, in matrices for their own right. And there are plenty of reasons to be interested in matrices by themselves. But oftentimes we want to take a matrix and multiply or act it on a vector, just like we're acting a function on an element of, of a set. So let's now suppose that, that we actually do that. Let's say that we have a product of two matrices and this product acts on a vector X. And we could even ask ourselves what the dimensions of this vector would have to be. And in order to do that, we'd say, okay, well, what are first the dimensions of this resulting matrix? And the resulting matrix has dimensions of three by three. So maybe let me just do this. So if A is a three by three and B is a three by three, the resulting matrix together will be a three by three matrix. And this inherently tells us what the dimension of our vector needs to be. In order to take a product like this, the inner dimensions always need to match. So if this is a three, this has to be a three, which indicates that we have three rows in our single column vector. So this is gonna be a, a three by one uh, object we can think of. Now let's, but what I'd like to do though is, is to try to gain an understanding for what is visually going on. How can we think of matrix multiplication when it acts on a vector? And again, it, when we were talking about matrix multiplication, we were relating this to function, uh, I, I believe it's function composition. When, when you have one function being, a, I guess nested functions in a way, where you have f of g, right? And if that were to act on X, that would be like F of G of X, this whole idea, right? So let's, for example, say that B, it's, it's a, it is a matrix, but, but let's try to attach a visual picture to what's going on. Maybe it takes whatever this vector is, whatever the arrow in space is, if that's how we think about it intuitively. And let's say it rotates it by, by some angle. In other words, we can call this a rotation matrix. So maybe if uh, this is X and it starts like this, maybe after B is applied to X, it takes it from here and it rotates it to here. Okay. And then maybe A is not a rotation matrix, but maybe it is a matrix which stretches every vector in, in the vector stem, R3. So maybe it, we could say, what, what do we call this, a stretch? 
I think we called it like a dilation matrix, but I'll call it a stretching. I don't know. You get the idea, right? It, it takes, it, if you have a, an original vector of this size, maybe it stretches it to two times its length, then it's gonna be this size after the transformation. So what we would like to ask then is what is the combined effect? And hopefully you can imagine, it's almost like X is just being passed through a machine where the first phase of that machine will, will take it and it will rotate it and the second phase of it will, will simply stretch it. So what we can do is, is let's say this is our starting vector X. After B gets applied to it, then maybe it gets rotated by a certain amount. So it'll go from here to here. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep it to have the same length. Let's see if that's roughly correct. So I'm, I'm trying to have it where the length isn't necessarily changing, but it's only being rotated. So after B acts on X, this is our new vector. And this new vector acts as the input to the matrix A. Then when we apply the matrix A, maybe it stretches it to twice its size. Maybe now the vector looks like that. Where we haven't, the goal is, in the drawing is to say that it hasn't changed the direction, the way that it's pointing in space, but, but it's just, it's, it's doubled in length, okay? So, so this is how we can think of matrix multiplication. It's just applying one transformation after another. And then the other main idea that, that aligns similarly with this is that if we were to just take the matrix product, A and then B, we're going to get a three by three matrix as the output. I think we called it C. All right, so maybe we can just say that rather than A times B, it's, it's some new matrix C, where we obtain C by the, the row by column rules that we were talking about in the last video. What we could ask ourselves is, well, what does C do as a matrix? If it is a matrix, it is, it is a function that maps from one vector space into another. And the idea is that it just combines the effects, the effects of A and B. So it is a matrix that both rotates and stretches the matrix all at once. So rather than maybe thinking of this in two steps, we could also imagine starting with this vector, applying whatever C is to it, and then not only does it rotate, but it also doubles in length after a single transformation. So you can get combined effects from matrices by, by just taking products of potentially individual effects as well. I wish I mentioned that earlier, but, but I'm, I'm, I, this is why I wanted to, to mention it now. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Now, that, that is enough of, of talking about the, the last video, because if you will notice that the section title for this video is very different. And to, to motivate why we're gonna be talking about this thing called the Levy Savita symbol, uh, I want to, to first mention that there is an additional property that requires a little bit of background when talking about properties of matrices. Because in the last video we talked about, I guess, the inverse and the transpose and the trace and, and these operations that can be defined relatively quickly. But there is another uh, property or, or quantity that is associated with a matrix called a determinant. But unlike the transpose, inverse, tracer, or some of these other uh, relatively straightforward operations, the determinant of a matrix takes a little while to unpack. And you need to know, to, to understand the definition of a determinant. In other words, if I were to just write out the determinant is this, uh, the definition would look very confusing, not only because it's, it's naturally a confusing definition, but, but also because there's this quantity that shows up which is this thing called the Levy Savita symbol. But in order to even understand what that symbol is, we need to, to spend a little bit of time developing some framework to understanding that. So big picture idea for, for this video. This video is gonna be about developing that framework. We're gonna take a little bit of a break from matrices just for that this video in order to develop that framework to say this is what the Levy, the Levy Savita symbol is. And once we know what the Levy Savita symbol is, then we're gonna throw that back into to this thing called determinants to get back to properties of matrices, these linear maps, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. That's gonna be the plan for, for this video. Um, one more thing that, that I wanna mention too, 
feel like I say one more thing a lot, promise last thing before we, we start, is I am making a simultaneous video series on group theory as I'm making the this one here on linear algebra. And some of the concepts that get talked about in that video series also very similarly relate to here when we talk about uh, permutations and K cycles and, and concepts like these. So if you've already seen those videos, I don't think you really need to watch this video, to be honest. I mean, you can if you want, but a lot of this stuff is going to be an overlap. In case what I explain in this video is confusing too, I will post my other, or I'll have the link for the other video in the description. So hopefully between the two of those or just some other external resource, the concepts can get in your head somehow. All right. Now, that's enough talk. Let's, let's actually get into doing things, right? First thing, in order to, to understand this thing called the levy civita symbol, is we need to understand what a permutation is. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write out the definition to say this is what a permutation is, and then we're going to go through that as a first step. Okay, so we have the definition for a permutation right here. It says that a permutation on a set S is simply a bijection, which they're calling, in the, the notes, they're calling epsilon, which goes from S into S. Okay. Now this seems like a very general, just kind of arbitrary definition in a sense. And so I, I really want to spend some time unpacking this because I don't think this is that, this needs to be this complicated. It's just that when we first see the definition, and especially for the first time, it can be somewhat intimidating. Uh, very first thing, just in terms of notation, a lot of times permutations get denoted by a Greek letter. Uh, this is, the notes use the Greek letter epsilon. So I try to draw it in, in epsilon here, but you might see rho or sigma or tau, or those are some other common Greek letters used to denote a permutation. But just as kind of like a, a math, it's. It's one of those unspoken rules where we, we typically write permutations as Greek letters. So if, if you see that, uh, that's, that's just kind of a, a, a thing, basically. But now let's let's actually dive into the definition. First thing, it says a permutation acts on or a permutation is associated with a set S. Notice that we're we're just talking about an arbitrary set as opposed to a vector space, which is a set that has a lot more uh, defined structure in it. So, so this is, I guess, kind of just a reminder, we are taking a break just for this video on matrices and vector spaces in general. We are just talking about arbitrary sets here. This is a very general concept. So a permutation is associated with the set S and it's a specific type of function. What type of function? It is a bijective function in which both the domain and the codomain are the exact same set S. So a permutation is not associated with two different sets. You only need one associated set with the permutation because that acts as both the domain and the codomain for that function. Now, let's, let's remind ourselves what it means to be a bijective function or to be a bijection. A bijective function is both injective and surjective. And there are these mathematical definitions to describe what that means, but essentially, if a function is injective, maybe let me even do this real quick. Let's draw some set bubbles. So this is the domain, which I guess could be S, and this is the codomain, which will also be S, and the function which maps between them is epsilon. If epsilon is an injective function, that tells us that every element in the codomain gets mapped to at most a single time from elements in the domain. So what, what, what it means to be injective is that either an element in here will get mapped to a single time or it will not get mapped to at all. If a function is surjective, then every element in the codomain gets mapped to at least one time, meaning every element here is gonna get mapped to either one time or multiple times by given elements in the domain. And the only way that a function could be both injective and surjective, or bijective, is if every element in the codomain gets mapped to exactly a single time. So every dot that I were to draw out here 
would get mapped to by exactly one corresponding element from the domain. And the only way that can be true is if the number of dots in the domain or the size of the domain is the same as the size of the codomain. So, which kind of makes sense, right? Like if, if we have a set or if we have a function going from one set into itself, they're necessarily the same size, which is one of the prerequisite concepts for a bijective function. So hopefully that kind of naturally motivates why we would have a bijective function. Now let's, let's think about what this means for a second though. Let's suppose that my set S, rather than just drawing these as arbitrary dots with bubbles, let's make a, a small concrete example where maybe this is the set that has four elements in it. And I can denote those four elements simply by the numbers one, two, three, and four. And the codomain is gonna be the same because we have the same set. If every element in the codomain gets mapped to by exactly one element in the domain, I can just draw out an example of what that might look like right now. I could say one might map to two, two maps to four, three maps to three, and four maps to one, or something like that. Right. This would be an example where every element in the codomain gets mapped to a single time. But, but let's also write out this visual picture in terms of applying the function on elements in the domain. If epsilon acts on one, it, that goes to two. So epsilon of one is two, epsilon of two is four, epsilon of three is three, and then finally epsilon of four is one. Hopefully it makes sense how we got that, right? And what I'd like, what I want to do is I want to write out the permutation in this way because I think it makes the intuitive idea a bit more clear when, once we go through it. Let's instead of, rather than thinking about these as numbers, let's think about these as, or just arbitrary numbers, let's think about these as numbers associated with a given card in a deck. And, and maybe rather than just having four cards in a deck, maybe I have n cards in a deck. So what we would be saying here is that the first card maps to the second card, or, and then card two maps to card four, card three maps to itself, card three, and card four maps to card one. It's almost as if, if we were to start with cards in a deck, labeled one, two, three, and four, with one on the top, then two, then three, then four, after we apply epsilon to those cards, it almost looks like the new deck would be two, four, three, one. And, and you could ask yourself, how do you take cards in positions one, two, three, four and turn it into two, four, three, one? What is the physical act of, of changing those? And, and that would just be shuffling the cards, right? And the act of shuffling is, I think, probably the most intuitive, compact way of understanding a permutation. A permutation, intuitively, can just be thought of as a reshuffling of the elements of a given set. And that's all it is. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, and I think the easiest way to think of that is, is through various cards. So if, if this was labeled 1 through 52, like all the cards in a deck, uh, then this would also be 1 through 52. They get reshuffled in some way, shape, or form. And you can imagine that also if we had a different permutation, a different bijection from S and S, maybe we call it rho. And let's do this right quick. Rho, which goes from S in to S. It would also have the same setup of having these set bubbles, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four. But maybe it maps things differently. Maybe one goes to four, four goes to one, two goes to three, three goes to two. Different functions correspond to different reshufflings, okay? Or I should say different permutations correspond to different reshufflings of a given deck, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. The permutation is just a reshuffling of a set that has however many elements. If the set S has N elements, a permutation will just shuffle those n elements. Now, how can we use notation to, to describe a given permutation, to describe an epsilon or a row or a sigma or whatever? 
Because you can imagine we're drawing these, these reshufflings or permutations out visually, but what if these sets were to have an infinite number of elements? I can't draw infinite bubbles, right? I need some sort of way to, to I guess, more compactly uh, draw these out or write these out. And I guess the notation that we're going to use isn't even going to necessarily solve that problem, but what I, I'd like to do is to introduce some notation that makes this whole picture a bit more compact. So we don't have all these arrows just flying around everywhere on the board, right? And the, the notation that gets used, at least in, in these lecture notes, is called two-row notation. And it is just another way of describing a given permutation, a given function of bijection from S into S. And I should mention, too, that there's, there, this is not the only way that we can use the notation to describe these types of permutations, but it's the one that gets used in, in Dexter's notes here. So I want to stick with, with that. What the function epsilon is doing, or what, what rho is, is doing, what any permutation is doing, is it will inherently take one number. Let's say S has n elements in it. So it will take one number from ranging in between 1 and n, like this. And it will take i, and it will map it to whatever the rule is specified by that permutation. So I will map to whatever epsilon is when it acts on I. And what we can do is we can come up with this thing called two row notation. And, and here's, here's what it looks like. You'll create a set of parentheses and this set of parentheses will have two associated rows with it. And when I talk about rows, I'm talking about how we think of rows, just horizontal lines. Uh, kind of like in a matrix. That being said though, this is not a matrix. Again, this video is a, a break from matrices. So we should not think of this necessarily as a matrix, but simply a, a way of organizing all these numbers. So in the two rows, the top row is going to be the numbers listed from one through n, just to denote the set of n elements. So we're gonna have one, two, three, all the way through n. And then the bottom row is going to be whatever the permutation maps each of those n numbers to. So 1 will map to whatever epsilon of 1 is. 2 will map to whatever epsilon of 2 is. 3, make some space for this. 3 will map to whatever epsilon of 3 is. And then finally, n will map to whatever epsilon of n is. And just by writing out the... The, the, the permutation in this way, we can write it a little bit more compactly than drawing out all these arrows. So let's just go through maybe these two examples of the two permutations we have on the board, epsilon and rho, and write those out in two row notation. Maybe actually just take a minute to pause the video and try to do it yourself, and, and then see if you get the same answer that, that I get on the board. Okay, assuming we have paused. So epsilon, is going to be a written in two row notation is going to have two rows associated with it. In this example, the, the set S only has four elements. So the top row is going to be denoted one, two, three, and four. And then let's just see what the, the bottom row is. One maps to two, so we put a two right there. Two maps to four, so we put a four here. Three maps to three, so we put a three here. And then four maps to one, so we put a one right here, okay? So that would be how we could write out epsilon and then same thing with rho. I'll go through this one a little bit quicker. So rho is gonna be, to make a little more room for rho. <laughs> the two rows of rho. <laughs> so rho is gonna be one, two, three, and four. And then we're gonna have one maps to four, Two maps to, that's why we're doing this. It's hard, hard to even see with the arrows, right? Two maps to three, three maps to two, and then four is gonna map to one. So that's how we could write out a permutation using two row notation. Now, one more thing that, that uh, 
is worth mentioning here. Notice that with each of these, each of these, I guess, notations to describe a given permutation or a reshuffling, all of the numbers in the top, like the domain numbers, map to seemingly a different number in the codomain, with the exception of this one right here. And there's nothing special about epsilon or the fact, nothing special about the number three. This is just an instance where the element in the domain maps to the same element in the codomain. What we would call this, if we have the one element in the domain mapping to the same element in the codomain, we would call that a fixed point. It's like after the reshuffling, it hasn't moved, it has stayed fixed. So we would call this a fixed point. And one nice thing about fixed points is that we can use those to help make our notation even more compact than it already is. And what we could do is we could say that because we have a fixed point 3, 3, we can simply not include it in the way that we write out our two row notation. So let's do this. Let me, let's, hopefully we can see down here at the bottom. I'm going to write the same epsilon in two row notation but now I'm going to omit the fixed point three. So one, two, four, and then we have two, four, one, like this. And the idea behind this is that if you know that your permutation acts on a set of, I guess this would be four elements, but in general, N elements, and you see a number omitted from the top row, the only way it's gonna be omitted or not included is, is inherently if you have a fixed point at that point. So if I say, okay, I have four elements here, but I don't see three, oh, I, I must know three maps to itself. So we can just omit fixed points and use the lack of information to our advantage to say, okay, that's what three maps to, and that allows us to make our notation more compact. Okay. So, so you, we'll, we'll see ourselves doing that relatively often. Now, hopefully all of this makes sense. Uh, when, when talking about this, we're inherently gonna start talking about cycles and, uh, and, and cycle types and, and these things called disjoint cycles. So that's gonna be the next step is say, okay, now that we hopefully understand that a permutation is just a reshuffling of N elements, let's start to get a little more specific and talk about various cycles and cycle types. So I'm gonna erase the board and then we're gonna go through all of that stuff next. Okay, so first thing is that we have the definition here for a disjoint permutation. And understanding disjoint permutations is gonna be relatively important. It says here that two permutations are considered disjoint if the numbers moved by one permutation are fixed by the other. And this is a very, like, I mean, kind of, I, I think personally this can be a bit confusing if it's not explained. So let's make sure that we understand this. To do this, I wanna go back to the permutation that we had row, which I think when we had one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and row map between the two, where I think we had one goes to four, four goes to one, two goes to three, three goes to two, kind of like swapping back and forth. If we were to write out row as a permutation, I think it would be one, two, three, four, and then it was four, three, two, one. Something like this, right? But what, what we could also do is we could say that rather than just having a single permutation, row, maybe we could write row as a product of two different permutations. Maybe row equals sigma times tau or something. Where the first permutation will maybe fix the numbers, or, or I should say, will only alter the numbers one and four, but will fix the numbers two and three. And this is what they're saying. The numbers moved by one are fixed by the other. So let's suppose that the first one, and, and I know I'm writing it to the right, but you can imagine if 
that when we have function composition, like if we had f of g of x, we act to the, the rightmost one. g acts on x first and then f acts after. That's why I'm saying the rightmost one is the first one. Then we, we can say this first one only acts on one and four, and one would map to four and four would map to one, like this. And maybe this function, while it has one going to four, four going to one, like it swaps the places of one and four, we're not writing two and three because maybe this function just fixes two and three. Maybe with this function, two maps to two and three maps to three. Right, so that's kind of using the, the more compact notation by having those two fixed points. And then maybe the second permutation will do kind of just the opposite. Rather than only looking at one and four, it's only gonna look at two and three. So then two goes to three and three maps to two, like this. And, and because we are not writing one and four in this two row sort of bubble, I guess, we can think of this function as fixing one and fixing four. Those are the two fixed points. One goes to one and four goes to four. So this is an equivalent way using two row notation to describe the permutation row. So we see that there's more than one way that we can apply a notation to describe a given reshuffling. And, and, and this, is, this is important right here because one of the properties of disjoint permutations, and we're not gonna go into the details of proving it in this video series. I'll link the, the group theory videos that go through proving those. But, but one of the properties is that whatever the permutation you have, it can always be written in disjoint permutation, or dis, how, do, how do I say this? Disjoint permutation notation. You can <laughs> write it in such a way that it's written as a product of disjoint permutations, where, where all of the numbers in one permutation are only contained in this guy, and all of the numbers in the other permutation are only contained in this guy. So notice that the one only shows one and four only show up here and two and three only show up here and nowhere else. You can imagine if you had more numbers too, we, we could just add on more bubbles. Maybe too, just to, let me um, try to, let's see. You could imagine that if we were to maybe include another number five, and maybe we'll say two goes to three, three goes to four, Five, five goes to two. I want, I want to not make it seem like this is too specific of a case. Maybe try for yourself to see how this permutation right here would be written in disjoint notation. Okay, assuming we've paused the video. The, the way that this would be applied is we don't necessarily need to write these as a product of things which are these bubbles with just two elements in them. This second, or this first bubble, or the second bubble, I guess I should say, is that we would have just two, three, and five, and then the, the bottom row, three, five, two. The idea of being a disjoint permutation simply means that all the numbers in here are not in here, and vice versa. Hence the definition, all the numbers moved in one of the bubbles would be fixed or not appearing in the, that uh, other bubble. And, and, and yeah, you can imagine if there were more numbers beyond this, then, then we would just have more bubbles. As long as the numbers only appear in exactly one, then it's written in disjoint notation. Hopefully that makes sense and that's, that's clear. Now, there's some additional terminology that can get used that, that often shows up that is useful just to mention. Whenever we only have two different numbers that are getting moved in a given permutation like this one right here. What we call this is typically a transposition or a two cycle. So let me write this up. So it could be written as a transposition or two cycle. And, and hopefully the, the idea behind a transposition, the phrase transposition, kind of makes sense because it's like one is going to four and four is going to one, right? It's like the one and the four are swapping places. If we remember in the last video when we talked about 
the transpose of a matrix. What we were doing when we were applying the transposition to a matrix is we were just swapping the rows with the columns. The, the, the first row became the first column, the second row became the second column, and, and, and so on, right? So it's the idea of swapping two things is, is the general concept that carries over into here, too. If we're just swapping two numbers with each other, we have a transposition. Now, the, the phrase two cycle comes from how many different numbers are being applied in, in a given, I guess, bubble right here. We always have two rows, no matter what, hence the phrase two row notation. But if we also have two, I guess, columns, even though we're not talking about a matrix, that would be considered a two cycle. Now, this uh, permutation right here has three columns or three numbers that are getting shuffled around. So this would be considered a three cycle. Let's write that. Be a three cycle. And you can probably imagine that, that in general, if, if we had more of these individual bubbles, right, with, with many more elements, and maybe a given bubble had K different, I guess, columns, or K corresponding numbers that got reshuffled around, that would be considered a K cycle. So just some, some additional terminology that, that we'll see that, that shows up. Now, I, I think one more thing before I move on is, is we might be slightly confused with, with saying that the, every permutation can be written in disjoint notation because if we went back to the case of, of epsilon, and I, I don't even remember what map to what, but I think it was something along the lines of, actually, I'm just going to come up with an epsilon to, to make my point. Let's just say if, if epsilon takes the numbers one, two, three, and four, that maybe this goes to two, three, four, one. It all shuffles it back, shuffles everything back by one spot. If, if you could ask yourself, how would we write this in disjoint notation? And the answer is we actually don't even need to do anything. All, this just happens to be the, the special case where all four numbers, every number in the set, shuffles with each other. So this would be written in disjoint notation already because the numbers in here are not contained in the numbers in another bubble. It's just kind of the special case where all the numbers are contained in one and none of the numbers are contained in another bubble because the other bubble doesn't exist. <laughs> right. So even in like the most general sense where you don't have like a clear split up like this, just writing out a permutation like this by itself is automatically having it in disjoint notation. Hence, hopefully why we can sort of see sort of intuitively that every permutation could in theory be broken into this, this disjoint notation. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, the, the next thing that is gonna be very important for this, this thing called the Levi-Civita symbol is defining a quantity associated with a given permutation called its sign, the sign of a permutation. So uh, that's gonna be the next step. I'm gonna erase the board and then we're gonna understand what, we're gonna go through what it means to look at the sign of a permutation together. Okay, so we have the definition here for the sign of a permutation, and there's quite a bit to, I guess, say about this, so let's go through it together. It says that the sign of a permutation rho, which can be written as SGN of rho, is equal to negative one to the R, where R is gonna be the number of two cycles when rho is written as a product of two cycles. Okay. Now, again, there's a, there's a lot to state here. First thing is that when we talk about the sign of a permutation, and we're gonna write SGN, kind of like short for sign, rather than SIN, because SIN would be like the trig function, the, the sign function, right? So SGN is a function, and the input to this function is a permutation. So a permutation acts as the input to this function. And the output to the function is gonna be negative one to the R. So depending on the value of R, it's either going to be negative one or, or positive one, right? 
we say, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. Now, the second thing to note is that you will not see this notation in, if you're following along in Dexter's lecture notes, at least his linear algebra le lecture notes. In his notes on, on yeah, that, that he's written out, instead of using SGN as the notation to denote the sign of a permutation, he will use epsilon to mean the same thing as SGN. So this would equal the same thing as negative one to the R. I opted out of using epsilon because we first introduced a permutation by the Greek letter epsilon in the first place. So it could be confusing if looking at it for the first time, it might look like it's a permutation acting on a permutation. And that's not what's going on here. Epsilon in his notes refers to the sign of a permutation, a function that acts on a permutation. And so to avoid that confusion, I wanted to write SGN instead. If you follow his group theory lecture notes called groups, he uses SGN to denote the sign of a permutation, which is, so, so it's, this is an equally valid way of denoting the sign, and I want to stick to this to avoid confusion. So that's the first thing. Now, next is, is this whole business about this number R here. R, they're saying, is the number of two cycles when rho is written out as a product of two cycles, okay? And in order to, to talk about this in a way that's intuitive, I'm not gonna go through the full proof. I'll leave those uh, that are interested in the proof to, to check out the group theory videos and I'll link those in the description. But we'll need to quickly talk about a different type of notation to describe a permutation, I think for it to really make sense. And let's suppose, for example, let me do this over here. This will be a real simple example. So let's say we have only a set with three elements and, and so it acts on one, two, and three. Maybe it increases the numbers by one. So one goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes to one. What we could do is rather than writing this out using two different rows, there is a type of notation called a cycle notation. And it's briefly mentioned in the, the, the Dexter's notes here on linear algebra, but I'm not spending too much time going through it because frankly, the reason why we're using all this stuff, the type of notation we use isn't really that important. But let me just quickly introduce it in, in a way that hopefully makes sense. So you start with this new notation called cycle notation, which I personally think is easier, is you have an open set of parentheses, then you take, you don't have to take the smallest number, but it's a typical convention to take the smallest number, so you take the number one and ask yourself, okay, what number does one map to? Well, one goes to two. So I'm gonna write out the number two right after that. Then I say, okay, well, what does two go to? Well, well, two goes to three. So then I'll write out the number three. Then we just keep on going. We say, what does three go to? Well, three goes back to one, which was the beginning number in my cycle. Hence, I will close off the parentheses to say this is a complete cycle. And this would be known as a three cycle because there are three elements in it. It'd be K cycle, there are K elements in it. And the idea, even though we're not gonna prove that any permutation can be written as a product of two cycles, here's the rough idea. You first show that any permutation can be written in disjoint notation. So you can write it as a product of disjoint, uh, I guess cycles, if you wanna call them that. And then let's say that this is a cycle and this is disjoint, meaning the numbers one, two, and three are only contained in this cycle even if the set's larger, has numbers four or five, six, whatever, they're not contained in this cycle. Once you have a disjoint cycle, what you can then do is, is you can say, this can be rewritten as one, two, two, three, like this. And to see why that's the same thing, I think it's easiest to just imagine these acting on various inputs. And here's what I mean. After all, these different ways of writing out a permutation, they're different notations to write out a inherently what a permutation is. A permutation is a function, a bijective function from a set into itself. So what that means is that if these are supposed to represent, these are notations used to represent functions, 
Those functions act on elements. What are the elements? Well, elements of a set. If that set has three numbers, this function will act on the numbers one, two, and three. Same thing here. This will act on one, two, and three. Let's see how these functions, which I claim to be the same, act on the numbers one, two, and three. If this function acts on one, say, okay, where does one go to? One goes to two. Kind of like we have one goes to two. So if this is row, this is row, and I claim this is row, row of one is two. Where does two supposed to go? Two goes to three. So then I say, okay, two goes to three. And then three goes back to the beginning to one. Now let's just apply the same thing here. Where does one go to? We look in the first bubble, one does not show up. It's almost as if it's a fixed point. So we ignore having to, to see how one gets modified here. Only the, the, I guess, mini bubble where the number one shows up is what we need to, to include when we see how it acts on the number one. So one doesn't show up here, we ignore it, we go to here, one goes to two. Then what about two? We see, okay, here, two goes to three. So now three is the input into here. But three doesn't show up here, so, so it just stays as three. And then finally three, let's see, let's see what happens when we input three. So if three is the input into this first bubble, three cycles back to two. So now the new number is two. And when two gets input into here, so it's, okay, two cycles back to one. So this is one. So we see that regardless of what input we have, whether it's one, two, or three, we get the same output using both of these two notations right here. And the idea is simply to say that if, if you have a permutation, ideally you can write it as a product of these two cycles or these um, transpositions. And what, what the number R is, because that's kind of what we're trying to get at. The number R is, is simply to say that take your permutation, write it as a product of two cycles. However many two cycles you have, that is the value of R. So in this case right here, we started with this permutation written in two row notation, and then we decomposed it into a product of two different two cycles. This would be the first one, and this would be the second two cycle. So in here, the, in this example, the value of R would be two. So the sine of rho would be negative one to the two, which would equal positive one. And the idea is that the sine function can take any permutation and split it into either being plus one or minus one. It's a way of, of kind of partitioning, part, partitioning permutations into one of two possible categories. Okay. That's what a sine is. Now, we're, we're almost done. What, what last thing that we're going to do is we're just going to write out the definition, finally, of the levi civita symbol. And we'll see that it's almost just a compact way of quantifying the sign of a permutation. There's a little bit more to explain, but, but not too much. So I'm going to erase, I guess, just this example right here. Write out the definition for the levi civita symbol, and then we'll probably call it after that to finish off the video. Okay, so here we have the levi civita symbol, kind of the, the final point for, for this video. So you, we can put words on it, but really this is what it is. It's this mathematical quantity, and we can try to run from epsilon if we want, but, but we ultimately can't run from it this time. <laughs> it is denoted as the symbol epsilon, and really what, what this is, is, is kind of the generalization of the alternating tensor, where if you remember, or what we called the alternating tensor a couple of videos ago when we were talking about vectors with, with the cross product and stuff like that. If you remember, we called the, the alternating tensor this quantity epsilon ijk, which was this quantity that had three unique subscript indices, i, j, and k. What this is is really a generalization of that. It is a similar quantity, but it has n subscript indices. And to denote each 
index. We're, we're going to call the first one J1, the second one J2, the third J3, all the way through the nth index J sub n. And if you remember, when we were talking about this epsilon ijk quantity, we were talking about the number of swaps between ij and k. But we weren't talking too much about these, these things called permutations because we could kind of pass through that kind of all of these barriers uh, by just talking about swaps. And, and we didn't need to go into all the detail. But really, when you have n different indices, how do you talk about various types of, of swaps? Well, you can first talk about just whatever these numbers are. It will be essentially a reshuffling of the numbers one, two, three, up through n, kind of like a set with n elements. Uh, and when you do that, when you have n elements written out in the way that, that these are right here, you can assign a permutation to them. And with a permutation, you could in turn define the sign of a permutation, where if the, if the sign is negative one to the R and R is even, meaning that sine of rho is plus one, we would call that an even permutation. And if sine of rho equals negative one to the R where R is odd, meaning that sine of rho is minus one, we'd call that an odd permutation. And that's kind of the, the language that they're using here in the definition. Basically, plus one is even, minus one is odd, so that is going to carry over into here. For the, the levi civita symbol, then it will its value, no matter how long this is, is either going to equal plus one, minus one, or zero. It's going to equal plus one if this quantity is an even permutation of these various numbers. So, so whatever the permutation that corresponds to this reshuffling, uh, if you define its sign, it's even, you get plus one. You get minus one if that permutation associated with these numbers is an odd permutation. And then, like with, with the levi civitas or the alternating tensor, whatever we're calling it, if you have any repeated numbers, then that would equal zero for this symbol. So, uh, really, this, this is a generalization, and we honestly probably just could have written this at the very beginning, but we would have no real sense of, of understanding where these, uh, where this comes from. Say that this is an even permutation, this is an odd permutation. All of that comes from understanding what permutations are as well as their signs. So maybe a more, I don't wanna say more compact way to write this is that basically this is going to be the same thing, like a little caveat with this, epsilon j1, j2 through jn is going to equal the sign of rho, where in, in the case where rho is these reordering of the numbers, so rho of i equals j sub i, um, these, this is going to be equal to this. The, the one exception is that when we have a permutation rho, we're never going to have repeated indices like, like what we have here. That would kind of contradict what it means to be a bijective function. So th this, this is like saying that this epsilon symbol is the same thing as a sign of a permutation, except when these indices are repeated, then it's going to equal zero. So however you think about this, oops, <laughs> that is what the levi civita symbol is. Now, uh, I think as a final thing that I want to say that's, that's slightly more general than all of this stuff, that that's all we're going to cover, at least for this video. But admittedly, this is my first time making a video that is kind of in, in between the edge of being more on pure math versus applied math. It's like right in the middle, right? You could definitely study linear algebra from a pure point of view, and you could study it from an applied point of view. And people that want to do both need to take introductory linear algebra. And because of that, I know that just from being in the, the STEM community that there are people that really enjoy proofs and want to say that if you're going to, to make claims like this, like the sign of permutation where you define R this way as a product of two cycles, you should definitely first prove that you can even do that in the first place, that you can first write rho as a product of two cycles. And there are people like that and then there are also people that, that really 
don't care about proofs. <laughs> they don't like them. And they say, I don't care about any of this. Just tell me what the symbol is and how I can use it to understand linear algebra because that's what I want to do. They don't care about all the details, right? So I understand that there are these different points of view. So it, it can be a little bit difficult at times to try to come up with the best way possible to make these videos to cater to, to both sides of that argument. So as for now, what the current plan is, is I'm probably going to be, when, when it comes to stuff like this, uh, especially where it feels like it's, it, it can be a little bit of a tangent from, from linear algebra, I'm going to try to skip, I'd say, the majority of the proofs, especially if I've already proven them in other video series. And what I'll end up doing is just linking the videos that have the proofs if you want to go through them. Or maybe if, if I feel like skipping the proofs but, but, but I haven't made a video on them yet, maybe I'll make a shorter video and link that shorter video for people who are interested. But I think the best way, on, and this is what I'm trying to say, I think the best way for me to gauge on what's the right amount of proving things versus not proving things for, for, for you guys, the people that are trying to understand the material, is for you to, to just give me feedback on what is useful for you. Is this skipping too much information? Is this going into too much detail? It can be a little bit of, gray, of a gray area to determine what's the best way to approach this stuff. So any feedback is, is always welcome. But yeah, that's, that's gonna be it for this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Next video, we're gonna return to, to linear algebra, properties and matrices, and, and we're gonna use this stuff, specifically this guy right here, Levi-Civita symbol, to talk about these things called determinants. So hopefully I will see you guys then.